the Golden Singers of Broad Ripple Magna School. And now the invocation will be done by Pastor John Ramsey, New Life Worship Center. Let's bow, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for Dr. King and the dream that he had. We thank you that that dream continues to live on even today. We ask your blessing be upon this program and all that takes place. We thank you for the choir. We thank you for all of those that will participate. And we pray that heaven will be pleased with what takes place over these next moments. We thank you for what you're going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ramsey, for those encouraging words. Good afternoon. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the 20th annual Statewide King Holiday Celebration. Uh, my name is Abdul Hakim Shabazz. I do a dorky little radio show here in Indianapolis, so no need to mention it, but I will. <laughs> Abdul in the morning, 14.30 a.m., weekdays, 6 till 9. So now management is happy. We can get to work. Uh, I'll be your master of ceremonies this afternoon. I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, so great to see many of you participating in this wonderful event. Uh, the Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Indiana Holiday Commission was created by statute to commemorate the life and the works of Dr. King. Uh, today's celebration promises to be one of our most memorable, so please uh, take your cell phones and your Blackberries and Crackberries and put them on silent. This place isn't going anywhere. It'll still be here in about an hour or so. Uh, to open our program today, I would like to bring to the podium Mr. Clayton Graham, the chairman of the Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Indiana Holiday Commission. Dr. Graham. Thank you, Abdul. Good afternoon, I'm Clayton Graham, chairperson of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Indiana Holiday Commissioner. To Governor Mitch Daniels, Superintendent Dr. Tony Bennett, members of the General Assembly, Speaker Bosma, President Long, Honorable Justices of the Indiana Supreme Court, all other elected and appointed officials, honored guests, fellow Hoosiers, and visitors. Welcome once again to the 20th Annual Statewide King Holiday Celebration. First, I would like to thank our sponsors, the Indiana Civil Rights Commission and the Indiana State Museum for working together for the fourth consecutive year. They have sponsored the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Educational Youth Summit. The purpose of the summit is to highlight and honor the legacy of Dr. King to middle and high school students all around the state. Next, I want to thank the members of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Indiana Holiday Commission for your support and dedication of keeping Dr. King's dream alive. Will you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> Additionally, I want to thank the Indiana Civil Rights Commission without their hard work this program would not be possible. Would you please stand and be recognized also? <laughs> then I want to thank that magnificent choir from Broad Ripple Magnet High School and the 500 students plus who joined us today beginning at 9.30 a.m. for the Dr. King Educational Youth Summit. In light of today's educational choices, whereby parents have the choice to send their children to public magnet school programs, to charter schools, there was a time when parents did not have a choice if their children attended public schools. However, there was a man who was inspired by Dr. King's fight for equality in education, a man who, like the great civil rights attorneys before him, such as Thurgood Marshall, Spotswood Robinson, Charles Hamilton Houston, Jack Greenberg, and Wally Branton. This man was a local man, and his name was John Moss. Attorney John Moss, Jr., 74, was born in Alabama and grew up during a period of segregation. After graduating from Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana, Attorney Moss moved to Indianapolis to attend Indiana University School of Law. Upon graduation from law school in 1961, he taught for one year at what is now Florida State University School of Law, 
before returning to Indianapolis. Attorney Moss practiced law from 1962 to 2005, focusing on employment discrimination and civil rights law. He formed a law firm with Mercer Nance, Charles Walton, and the firm was known as Nance, Walton, and Moss. Although Attorney Moss had many high-profile cases, his most notable and landmark case was the 1968 class action federal lawsuit against Indianapolis Public Schools on behalf of all African American students to desegregate the schools. This led to the ordering of IPS to be bused within the district and eventually to Marion County Township Schools to achieve racial balance. Unfortunately, Attorney Moss passed away during the Christmas holidays. However, it is only just and proper that we acknowledge his contributions. Therefore, on behalf of Governor Daniels and the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Indiana Holiday Commission, we would like to present Attorney John Moss with the Distinguished Hoosier Award. Will Mrs. June Moss and her son, Attorney Mark Moss, please come forward to accept this award from Governor Daniels. Thank you for your work. Another round of applause uh, for real civil rights pioneers, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Next, I'd like to take a few moments uh, for the men of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity uh, to pay tribute uh, to Dr. King. Q for Alpha men to walk. Whoops, that's the parentheses, never mind. Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity was founded in 1906 at Cornell University. It is the oldest African-American Greek letter organization in America. The men of the Iota Lapta Chamber honor the legacy of their deceased fraternity brother, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., by presenting this reef in recognition of the tremendous impact that he had, not only in America, but also around the world. Please rise as we pay tribute to our fallen brother and soldier in the struggle for freedom and equality, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He was a peaceful conduit for change and social justice, and so please join us for a moment of silence as we remember the man, the dream, and the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and the Reef is Place. Thank you all very much, and thank you to the members of the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Thank you, gentlemen. It is an honor and privilege uh, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, every once in a while, I end up doing an event and where I get to introduce the governor. And I, I jokingly tell him it's always fun to introduce the governor of Indiana, because back home, if you're on stage with the governor of Illinois, you're probably in a police lineup. So it's kind of nice to, to be here. That joke works so much better in Chicago when I tell it, by the way. <laughs> Mitch Daniels is the 49th governor of the state of Indiana. Before he occupied the office, uh, just off the state rotunda, he in the, here in the state house, he served a top leadership in positions in both business and government. He's a co-founder of the Oaks Academy here in Indianapolis and has been honored by the Center of Leadership Development for Minority Business and Professional Achievers Awards recognition. And just last week, the governor was one of three recipients honored for leadership and commitment to fiscal stewardship at the first ever Fiske Award dinner. Ladies and gentlemen, the governor of the great state of Indiana, Mitch Daniels. Thanks to each of you for joining us again on one of the most special and certainly meaningful uh, occasions that happens all year. And it's been such a privilege now uh, these seven times 
for me to take personal part. And I, I express to you on behalf of all our fellow citizens uh, deep gratitude that you took time from your schedules to be with us all today, too. Dr. King was many things, but first and before all else, he was a man of faith. Uh, there, you will search uh, um, without, uh, to no avail to find any of his most uh, remembered speeches that do not involve at least some reference to Scripture. Many of them took their inspiration directly from Scripture. It's in Mark that we learn that Jesus said, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake or for the sake of the good news will find true life. If anyone in our memory found true life, it was Dr. Martin Luther King who led his entire life and ultimately gave it for his creator and for the good news to which he added so very much. Dr. King himself left us with so many words of wisdom. One of my favorites has always been, faith is taking the first step when you don't see the whole staircase. Dr. Martin Luther King led America up the first steps on the staircase to true freedom and equality. Uh, he, as he said, didn't know where that staircase would end or where it would lead. Now we know more. Blessed as we are to have risen the first few steps to legal equality and to, I believe, tracing directly to Dr. King's witness, a consensus in our country that en encompasses all but the last few hearts yet to be reached a consensus on the need for justice and the need for racial harmony and equality. There are steps left to take and we all know it. And I think it's become more and more clear to Americans everywhere that to take the next steps toward true equality and a true justice, education must be better than it is today, and it must reach each and every young American so that they can live out the lives, live out the, full, the fulfillment of the legal equality which Dr. King did more than anyone to bring to us. I point out to young people whenever I'm discussing Dr. King his second distinctive and distinguishing characteristic, he was a well-educated man. He educated himself in large part, but he had been a very diligent student, and it showed. We wouldn't remember him otherwise. Oh, we might remember him, but not as the towering figure he was, because it was his learning and the incredible gift he had for communicating what he learned that grabbed the attention, ultimately the hearts of tens of millions of his fellow Americans. There's that old phrase, the King's English. It's meant to connote the proper, perfect use of the English language. I was thinking about that this morning. In Dr. King, and by the way, our speaker, Mr. King. We have two great practitioners of the King's English. Tim said this would put him under pressure, but I'm just going to do it anyway. I don't think you're going to hear him say, he don't, or me and him went, or I be, or any other such usage this morning. Like Dr. King, our speaker has been a man of action, but he's also a man of great eloquence who's able to express his passion for justice and his love of young people in words that stir me when I read about him, when I talk to him in person. 
I really do believe the best way now for us to honor Dr. King and to try to live up to his legacy and to try is to try to take that next step up the staircase on which he got us started and to ensure to every young person in our state the very best chance in life. Tim King, from whom you'll hear in a minute or two, has been succeeding in doing that under the most challenging of circumstances. He has proved the doubters wrong. He has proved the skeptics to be in error. And he has shown us, as Dr. Martin Luther King did before, that in America, where justice prevails, all things are possible. I know everyone here is committed to these ideals, eager to help us all work together to find the next step up the staircase of freedom. And we commit ourselves as your stewards and your employees to doing our best to make that so the balance of this year until we meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Governor Daniels. Uh, we've now reached the award presentation segment of today's program. Uh, this year's award recipients have all personified the visions, the hopes, the dreams, and aspirations of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Through their dedication and vision, they each dramatically will improve their community. We'll begin our program by presenting the Freedom Award. This award is granted annually to an individual or project whose major societal influence includes breaking down barriers that have divided us and building ongoing relationships that foster respect, understanding, and harmony in our schools and our communities. This year's 2011 Freedom Award recipient is Ms. Diane Clements. Diane? <laughs> Ms. Clements has served Ms. Clements has served as the Executive Director of the Evansville Vandenberg County Human Relations Commission since 2004. In her role as Executive Director, she has worked to foster a climate of tolerance and understanding and serving as a bridge builder between the Evansville community and city government. She is a graduate of the University of California, Los Angeles, where she holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Sociology, and she also serves on the Executive Committee of the Indiana Consortium of State and Human Local Rights Agencies the Board of Directors of Evansville Celebration of Diversity Distinguished Lecture Series, Board of Trustees of the Vandenberg County Community Foundation, Evansville Police, obviously she doesn't sleep much, yeah. Department of Diversity Council, United Way of Southwestern Indiana Allocations Panel, and the Evansville Homelessness Advisory Committee. She's a member of the Evansville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, where she serves on the Executive Board and Chairperson of the Social Action Committee. She's also a member of Zionsville, or Zion Missionary Baptist Church, where she served as an usher board and on the transportation ministry. She's also a recipient of the NAACP Lifetime Community Advocate Award. Once again, a round of applause and congratulations for Ms. Diane Clements, the recipient of the 2011 Freedom Award. Our next award recipient will be recognized with the Passing the Torch Award. Now this award is given to an individual or organization whose work and commitment is encouraging peers to become involved in the fight for freedom of all people, exemplifying the spirit of Dr. King. The 2011 Passing the Torch Award recipient is Miss Kendra King. Kendra? Kendra is an honor student at Muncie Southside High School and ranks six <clears throat> in her senior class. She is a member of the student council, basketball, and tennis teams. She's also a part of the National Honor Society as the vice president and a Delaware County CC Pride team member. Always keeping busy during the summer, Ms. King has worked for Future Choices. That is a not-for-profit organization that supplies training for disabled individuals. She's participated in the state marching band, volunteered at Animal Rescue Foundation, Muncie Black Expo Summer Celebration, YMCA Black and Hispanic Achievers Program and the Feed My Sheep Thanksgiving Program, as well as Second Harvest Food Bank. She is also a recipient of the 2010 J.C. Penny Care Share Win Scholarship, and a matching amount was awarded to the Muncie YMCA. And the YMCA partnered with Ivy Tech Community College to match a contribution and established a scholarship in Kendra's name for needy minority students to be awarded annually. And after graduation, she plans to attend the University of Southern Indiana, where she will study criminal justice. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's all give a big round of applause to Ms. Kendra King, a 2011 recipient 
of the Passion of the Torch Award. Our third and final award uh, given this afternoon by the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission is given each year by the chairperson. It recognizes a local organization, program, and initiative that makes significant contributions toward achieving the dream of Dr. King in areas of economic development, poverty reduction, poverty reduction, social justice, and peacemaking efforts. This year, the Chairman's Award recipient is Hero, is Hero Camp Incorporated of Mishawaka, Indiana. Can Pat and BJ please come on up? Now, now, get a little of this story, ladies and gentlemen. In the spring of 1989, Pat Mackley told some kids on the street, if you can beat me in a one-on-one -on -one basketball game, I'll buy you a new pair of sneakers of your choice. Next Saturday morning, there were more than 60 kids outside of Heroes Camp. <laughs> it goes without saying that Pat Mackley never lost a game of basketball, but he and his wife of 37 years, BJ, have bought thousands of pairs of sneakers for young kids in Michiana. Pat, BJ, their only child, Kelly, started Heroes Camp with rugged faith, unwavering prayers, and personal sacrifice to answer the call of God and to serve the underprivileged and overlooked generation of young men. Beginning in their home, where Pat held Bible study while BJ served home-cooked meals for young men that came through their home, Heroes Camp has grown tremendously over the last 22 years. Mentoring young men, Heroes Camp offers the support of food, clothing, shelter, tutoring, counseling, and haircuts to the World of God youth of the Michiana community, all free of charge. Using sports as a conduit, they reach out to young men who are dealing with the impacts of gangs, substance abuse, hunger, and family challenges. In May of 2007, due to an increase in participation, Heroes Camp moved into their stunning new expansive facility, which includes a kitchen, barbershop, expanded administrative offices, and a family room. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's congratulate our 2011 Chairman Awards recipient, Heroes Camp, accepting on behalf of Heroes Camp Arts founders, Patrick and Bobby Magley. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our final award given this afternoon is the Indiana Civil Rights Commission Highest Honor. It is an award created to recognize the trailblazers, those individuals who, inspired by Dr. King's dream, had devoted their personal and professional efforts to creating social justice in America and the state of Indiana. And this year's 2011 Spirit Award recipient, and can't think of a better person myself, is the Honorable Tanya Walton Pratt. Judge Pratt was appointed to the United States District Court in the Southern District of Indiana on June 15, 2010. She is the first sitting African, first African American judge or federal judge in Indiana history, filling the vacancy created by the elevation of Judge David F. Hamilton to the United States Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. From 2008 until her appointment to the federal bench, Judge Pratt served as in Marion Superior Court Probate Division as a judge. She was elected Superior Court Judge in November of 1996, and she served as presiding judge of the Superior Court Criminal Division from 1997 to 2008. She also served as Master Ceremon Master Commissioner, Master Ceremonies are getting all mixed up up here, Master Commissioner for the Marion County Superior Court from 1993 to 1996. Prior to her election as Superior Judge, she was active in private practice as a partner in the firm of Walton and Pratt, focusing primarily on family law, bankruptcy, and probate law. She also served as a contract public defender during her years of private practice. Judge Pratt is active in Indianapolis and the Marion County Bar Association and has served as vice president in the past of the Indianapolis Bar Association and is a member of the board of directors of the Marion County Bar Association. She is a member of the Indiana State Bar Association and National Association of Women Judges and serves on the Indiana Lawyer Reader Advisory Panel and she served as faculty for the Indiana Continuing Legal Education Forum Annual Practice Skills Summit and frequently serves as a faculty member for the Indiana Judicial Conference. In 2005, she was Chief Justice Randall Shepard's appointee on the Indiana Sentencing Policy Study Commission and has served as a member of the Marion County Superior Court Executive Committee and a member of the House of Delegates for the Indiana Bar Association. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let's all please congratulate the 2011 Spirit of Justice Award, the recipient, the Honorable Tanya Walton Pratt. And in case you guys are wondering, although we started just a, a couple minutes behind schedule, one of the reasons that uh, Jamal doesn't pay me the big bucks is to keep us on time. And we are, although we started about five minutes late, we're right on schedule. So thank you all very much. And now, first of all, before I go look further, another round of applause for all our awards recipients uh, this afternoon. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for this afternoon, Mr. Tim King. Mr. Tim King is a founder, president, and CEO of Urban Prep Academies. That is a nonprofit organization operating a network of public college prep boy schools in Chicago, including the nation's first all-male charter high school and related programs aimed at promoting college success. 100% of all Urban Prep graduates, all African-American males, mostly from low-income families, have been admitted to four-year colleges. Can I get my nephew to apply to your school, please? <laughs> We're, we're talking after this is over. <laughs> Mr. King also serves as an adjunct lecturer at Northwestern University and has contributed to the Chicago Tribune, Sun-Times, and the Huffington Post. He was named as ABC World News as Person of the Week and People's Magazine Hero of the Year. He's been featured on Good Morning America, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and has been recognized by both Presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton for his work with youth. Mr. King has completed postgraduate work in Kenya and Italy and holds the doctorate honors causia from the Adler School and has received a bachelor's of science in foreign service and a Juris Doctor degree from Georgetown University. And now without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcome to the podium, Mr. Tim King. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you don't stand up now. You don't, who knows what I'm going to say? Wait till afterwards, and maybe, if you're still here, you stand up then. This is a lot of pressure the governor has put on me. I can't uh, split my subjects and verbs. I can't say ain't or don't in the wrong. I mean, it's, it's a lot of pressure, so I'm going to try to live up to it. It's, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. I appreciate every opportunity I have to speak to groups, but I'm particularly honored to be here in Indiana State, which really does get the importance of education reform and the need for high quality educational options and choices to be provided in, in the state. And uh, your great governor uh, is really leading that effort, and that's important. And I can't tell you how much that means to me as an educator to see someone at the head of government, to see legislators really understand the importance of educational reform and want to make positive steps in the right direction. So thank you very much for being here. I want to thank Jamal Smith and Danny Lopez and Ava from the Indiana Civil Rights Commission MLK program. It's great. Uh, I've been really welcomed in this very cold environment. I thought I was coming south to Indianapolis and it was going to be warmer than it is in Chicago, but I've been cold since the moment I stepped off the airplane. I'm going to try to heat it up a little bit right now, but it, you know, thank you very much, Jamal and Danny. Um, I really appreciate this invitation. Um, whenever I give speeches like this, I'm reminded of a uh, student of mine who had to give a speech and I asked him if he had his speech written and he said, no, Mr. King, I'm going to do it a cappella. <laughs> and I, I, if we're speaking the King's English, I think what we mean is extemporaneously. Uh, and I corrected the young man and told him he needed to write his speech down. So I actually wrote my speech down for you today, but I hope you don't mind if from time to time I decide to do it a little a cappella. <laughs> there are a couple of quotes. We're here celebrating the life of my fraternity brother, Martin Luther King Jr. I just joined the fraternity of out here. I am already a cappella, sorry. I uh, joined the fraternity, the fine, great fraternity of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated just a little while ago, and I'm proud to see some of my brothers there applying additional pressure to me, because if I mess up, they're going to get me in ways I can't discuss. Uh, 
here, but it, it, I'm, I'm really proud to uh, be a member of the fraternity, and it's great to be here honoring uh, Martin Luther King. And, and it wouldn't be right for me to do so without mentioning a couple of quotes. And, and Governor uh, Daniels actually mentioned one already. Take the first step in faith. You may not always see the whole staircase, but take the first step. Very important Martin Luther King quote. Another important one is, the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and critically. Intelligence plus character. That is the goal of true education. Intelligence plus character. The network of schools that I operate has been in the news a lot lately, as you all probably know. This has been because 100% of our first graduating class was admitted to four-year colleges and universities. The story's been covered in over 150 media outlets, including CNN, MSNBC, ABC World News, People Magazine, Good Morning America. The blogosphere has been buzzing, and the story, I can honestly say, has gone viral. So viral, in fact, that friends of friends of friends of mine sent me emails asking me if I heard about this great school in Chicago that got all those boys in college. I would answer, yeah, I heard a little bit about that school. But it's interesting to me that we've received this kind of coverage because who knew that a black boy getting into college was such a big deal? Who knew that a black boy getting into college was such a big deal? I ask that question with a little bit of irony. On the one hand, I do know it's a big deal. Black boys have the highest high school dropout rate in the country. The Schott Foundation's most recent study pegged that number at about 50% nationally, about 60% in Chicago and here in Indiana. According to research done by the Council of the Great City Schools, black boys without disabilities, black boys without disabilities, score lower on math tests than white males with disabilities in our country. Black males have the highest rates of contact with the criminal justice system among their peers. The leading cause of death for young black men is homicide. The third leading cause of death is suicide. Perhaps most startling is that back at home in Chicago, and this isn't all that different from most urban centers, only one in 40, 2.5% of black boys who start out in public schools will end up with a four-year college degree by the time they're 25. So yes, a black boy going to college is a big deal. But on the other hand, I stand before you a black man who was once a boy who went to college. I stand before you honoring a black man who was once a boy, Martin Luther King Jr., who went to college. I know plenty of black men who were once boys who went to college. There are plenty of black men sitting in this audience right here, including my alpha brothers, who were once black boys who went on to college. So the world I grew up in, going to college wasn't the exception. Going to college was the rule. The conversation I had when I was growing up around my dinner table wasn't about, are you going to college? It wasn't even about, what college are you going to? My parents were wondering if I was going to go to med school, law school, or get my MBA or PhD. Those were the conversations I was having in my household. So for me, a black boy going to college isn't a big deal at all. Because you see, in my world, black boys go to college. And if I'm being honest, I think the reason I started Urban Prep had a lot to do with me wanting to make these two worlds collide. The world in which I grew up, in which a black boy going to college wasn't a big deal, and the world in which we live, in which a black boy going to college rarely, if ever, happens. Whenever anyone talks to me about urban prep, the first questions they ask me are, one, how does it feel to achieve your goal, and two, how did you do it? Both questions are tricky to answer, not because the responses are complex. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The answers are quite simple, but sometimes, as you know, the simplest things can be the hardest to explain. My answer to the first question of how does it feel to achieve our goal is, 
We haven't achieved our goal. The mission of urban prep isn't to get kids into college. The mission of urban prep is to prepare students to succeed in college. Meeting our goal cannot be measured, therefore, by lining our walls as we do with the college admission letters that our students receive. Meeting our goal is realized when our students finish college. Don't get me wrong, having a 100% college acceptance rate, and those are in the four-year colleges and universities, by the way, having a 100% college acceptance rate for a group of low-income African-American boys who started high school woefully behind, in this particular class, only 4% were reading at grade level when they started as freshmen. It's an important milestone that we've achieved this. But it isn't the end. It is, in many ways, just our beginning. The second question I get all the time is, how did you do it, Tim? That's also simple to answer. We worked really hard. We worked really, really hard. While that's a simple answer, it begs for greater clarity. The first thing that we did was we worked hard at creating a program that was geared specifically towards the needs of our students. We knew that all of our students would be boys, so we looked at the research on how boys learn, how they interact, how they are motivated. We knew the vast majority of our students would be poor, so we worked hard at implementing the types of programs and supports they would need to be successful. You aren't able to eat at home, we're gonna provide you with breakfast. You need lunch, we'll do that too. You need a place to study after school because you don't have any power or electricity at your home, we'll provide you with a place to study after school. We worked hard at planning a curriculum that was culturally relevant. We didn't say, we're not gonna teach Shakespeare because Shakespeare wasn't a black male. We said, we're gonna figure out how to teach Shakespeare to a group of black males so that black males understand what Shakespeare was talking about, what poetry and eloquence in writing, literature, and theater can really be. We have worked very hard, very hard, from the first moment we opened. And all of this really boils down to creating an environment in which college is real and tangible not just some ethereal idea or concept. We had to create a school which gave students swords and shields that gave them, as Martin Luther King would say, that true education. The sword is the high quality college prep education based on a rigorous curriculum that allows students to fight those intellectual battles with the best of them. The shield is the self-confidence, self-possession, and self-awareness necessary for a student to defend himself in what is often an unfriendly and hostile world. These swords and shields, in my opinion, are the essential ingredients for successfully educating any child. I think we know, or at least have some idea, of how to give students those metaphorical swords. But the shields are a bit more elusive. How do you create self-confidence? self-possession, self-awareness in a student. At Urban Prep, our students develop these shields thanks to our positive school culture, which is grounded in four elements, responsibility, respect, ritual, and relationships. We create an environment in which students are responsible by having a student code of conduct. We set the expectation for behavior, communicate that expectation, provide students with the means to meet those expectations and hold students accountable to those expectations. Respect is another major focus of our school culture and a society in which kids kill kids because they've been dissed, short for disrespected, we felt it was essential to create a climate in which students understand that they are respected. At Urban Prep, we refer to our students only by their surnames. It's Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, Mr. Johnson, not John, Bob, Bill. And the reason we do that is you just can't imagine the power that an adult calling a young man, sir, communicates. The level of immediate respect that that young man feels is being provided to him when an adult, a grown-up, is saying, Mr. Smith. Amazing, amazing what respecting someone 
can do for making them respect themselves. The third element of the urban prep school culture is ritual. If we expect our students to behave differently, to learn differently, to live differently, then we have to make sure that they are part of something different. One way we do that is by creating rituals which our students associate with being uniquely urban preps. We start every day with a ritual that we call community. It is an all-school assembly where we recognize students who have achieved, admonish those students who have faltered, and recite the urban prep creed. Let me digress for one moment since I bring up the creed and just let you know something about our school creed. It is a statement, 18 short lines, which communicate what we're all about at Urban Prep. Our mission is to prepare young men to succeed in college. Our motto is we believe. Our creed is how we believe. We came up with the creed by bringing a group of our teachers together, every single person that worked for the school before we even had a school, we sat in a room and we asked the question. You know, our motto is we believe. So we asked the question, what is it we want our students to believe? And we came up with these 18 lines. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the third line of that creed is we are college bound. Our students recite that creed each and every morning at community. Do you understand the power of having a young man who doesn't know a single person in his life who's ever gone to college, to have that young man stand with his classmates every morning and say, we, not I, not them, we are college bound. Four years later, those guys who started that graduated from urban prep and went on to college. Powerful, powerful powerful stuff. The other, the fourth of the elements that make up the urban prep school culture after responsibility, respect, and ritual I think is the most important and that's relationships. At urban prep we don't believe that we can reach students and break through without developing strong, positive, deep, trusting relationships. Every student at Urban Prep is placed in a small group. When he's a freshman, we call that group a pride. We're the Urban Prep Lions. Lions live and travel in prides. Every single student belongs to a pride. That is a family within a family at Urban Prep. They are with this pride, with this group for all four years at Urban Prep. And that pride is led by adult, an adult who has the primary responsibility. He or she is on the front lines with that group of students mentoring, watching, monitoring, supporting them each and every day. All of the adults at Urban Prep have cell phones and email accounts that are provided by the school. All of the students and the teachers uh, and the parents have all the cell phone numbers and all the email addresses so that we can be in touch with each other and the students and parents can be in touch with us. Now we get phone calls from students, what's the homework tonight? We get phone calls from parents, when is report card pickup? But it's also important that we have this program because we get phone calls like, will you tell this boy to take the garbage out? Because we get phone calls like, it's one o'clock in the morning and it's Wednesday. I don't know where my son is. What do I do? We foster and build and develop those relationships with the parents and the students. And that really does contribute to the positive school culture that we've created at Urban Prep that will then lead to our students succeeding in high school, graduating, getting into college, going off to college, and succeeding once they are there. I've spent all of the time up to this point talking about what we do for our students, but I haven't spent much, if any, time talking about our students themselves, so I need to do that because they really are what we're all about. So I'm going to share with you a couple anecdotes which I think really crystallize what Urban Prep does and frankly what I think all schools should do, can do. Mr. Branch, note I'm calling him by his last name. Mr. Branch didn't want to come to Urban Prep. He was not interested in being in an all-male school. He wasn't interested in being in a school for two hours longer than students in other schools. 
He wasn't interested in wearing a jacket and tie every day. Governor Daniels said that Martin Luther King talked about the staircase. You got to take that first step with faith, right? Well, Mr. Branch saw the staircase. He didn't like it. So he did everything he could to escape urban prep. He did everything he could to get out. He started fights, he cut school, he refused to study. Eventually he got his wish and he left urban prep. He transferred out and he enrolled in a traditional neighborhood public school. At his new school, people weren't hassling him to hit the books. In fact, they didn't care if he studied at all. They weren't telling him to pull up his pants, straighten his tie or tuck in his shirt. They didn't care how he looked. They weren't telling him to live honestly, nonviolently and honorably as the urban prep creed instructs in case, in fact, they didn't care how he lived or in my view, if he lived at all. A few months later, after Mr. Branch had left urban prep, we noticed something interesting. We'd see him at our football games, sitting with his classmates, his former classmates. He'd be hanging outside at dismissal. Once I happened to go into a classroom at the end of our school day, and Mr. Branch was sitting in the classroom. He didn't go to urban prep anymore, but his other school had dismissed, and he came over to our school to hang out with his classmates in school. You see, Mr. Branch had gotten his wish. He was no longer a student at urban prep, but something changed. He wanted to be back. When he finally got up the courage to ask if he could transfer into urban prep, we said yes, because at urban prep, we don't believe in throwing kids away, even those who think they want to be discarded. So he returned to urban prep, and less than a year later, he was asked by a group of visiting educators about his most significant experience at urban prep. He said if, he had, if we hadn't taken him back, he would have been dead before his 18th birthday. He said, with tears streaming down his face in front of a group of educators from England, complete strangers to him, he said, at that other school, I was dying a little bit each and every day. Mr. Branch went on to win the coveted Urban Prep Medal for Most Improved Student. He became president of the student government. And uh, just a few weeks ago, he stopped by my office to say hello while he was home for winter break from Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Another student I should tell you about is a guy named Mr. Ponder. This is a young man who, as a freshman, he was the shortest member of our class, which meant that he had the honor of leading our procession at our annual convocation, another ritual that we do at Urban Prep to solidify that school culture. He was a very industrious student, in fact, so industrious that he decided he'd make a little extra money at school by creating a fight club. So this boy, he gets the... He gets to be called boy because he wasn't a young man doing this madness. This boy would get two classmates together to box. Then, as if that wasn't crazy enough, he would get his classmates to pay him to watch their classmates fight in the bathroom during school. He was like a little Don King. <laughs> Keyword little until we found out about it. I've been in education for 20 years. I have never in my life felt the need to expel a student more than I felt the need to do so with that young man at that particular moment. Mr. Ponder was doing everything contrary to what we believe at Urban Prep is important. Everything he was doing was contrary to our motto of we believe, to our mission, to our values, to our creed. As I sat in the office looking at Mr. Ponder contemplating his fate, I remembered that at Urban Prep, we don't throw students away, even those who think they want to be discarded. So we allowed him to stay. 
The following year, Mr. Ponder's mother moved to the great state of Indiana, and so he was faced with the prospect of transferring out of urban prep. He asked us if there was any way he could stay at Urban Prep, and we said, no, you can't live in another state. I mean, you can't even live in another school district and go to Urban Prep, let alone live in an entire another state and go to Urban Prep. He said, I really want to stay at Urban Prep. Why, Mr. Ponder, why do you want to stay at Urban Prep? Because this is where my family is. This is my home. And so we found a place for him to live in Chicago so that he could remain at Urban Prep. We provided him with money. To, to take the train from Chicago to Indiana on the weekends to visit his mother. This is how much we wanted him to be at Urban Prep and how much he wanted to stay. Recently, I was giving a talk at a dinner and I invited an Urban Prep graduate to attend the event. As I sat at the table listening to this Illinois State University freshman tell me about his double major, his leadership in the campus chapter of the NAACP, his work as a tutor and mentor at not one, but two local elementary schools, his aspirations to run a Fortune 500 company, his 3.6 college GPA. My, eye, my eyes got a little misty as they are right now because I thought, what if four years ago I had expelled this student for starting a fight club? What if we had never found a way to help him stay at Urban Prep? What if we had stopped believing? Now, one more story. We had a student at Urban Prep named Mr. Gardner who once said to me that he was tired of all these men telling him what to do. I said, you mean you're tired of all these adults telling you what to do in this strict environment that you uh, are in? He says, no, I don't mind the females, his words, telling me what to do. That's like my mom. That happens all the time. It's all these men who think they can tell me what to do that gets on my nerves. You see, Mr. Gardner hadn't had a man in his life giving him instruction direction or support. His dad OD'd when he was a young child and no other man stepped in to take his place. He was faced and forced to navigate the world without any male guidance. And so when he came to Urban Prep and had a bunch of men trying to help him, he resisted. And what a resistance it was. It was an incredible struggle working with that young man and getting him to make it through urban prep, but he did. And last summer, when I called him to see if he was all set to go to college, he told me that he wasn't going to college. I said, Mr. Gardner, are you crazy? Haven't you heard the news? Each and every one of urban prep's graduates has been admitted to college. You're going to college. He said, no, I'm not. I have to stay home and make some money to take care of my family. He's the man of the house, right? He's the head of his household. He can't go to college and take care of his mom and of his sister. He had to be the breadwinner. I told him, okay, you can stay here, get a job in maybe a fast food restaurant or a clothing store making eight, 10 bucks an hour. You can settle for a job that would pay you hundreds of dollars a week, hundreds of dollars a week, or maybe you can go off to college, earn a degree, get a job that pays you thousands, get a career. I told him that he had to decide if he believed. If he believed in his talent, if he believed in his potential, if he believed in himself. At the end of August, Mr. Gardner called me to tell me he made his decision. I wasn't happy with the prospect of that phone call because uh, Mr. Gardner was, you know, pig-headed guy. I knew he had made up his mind already, and I knew he wasn't going to college. I answered the phone with a heavy heart, and I said, uh, yeah, what's up, Mr. Gardner? Uh, he said, well, I, you know, I made up my mind, and I'm just wondering one thing. Yes, Mr. Gardner, what is it? He asked, will you give me a ride to Northern Illinois University? Classes start this week, and I don't want to miss a single one. The next morning, I drove straight to his house, garbage bags, all of his stuff in them, and we drove off to his future together. He believed. 
At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned the two questions that I get all of the time. How does it feel to achieve our goal? And how did we do it? But those answers are too simple. The question really is how do we know that what we're doing at Urban Prep works? And that answer is clear. How do we know that our students possess the swords and the shields necessary to achieve? How do we know that a school culture based on responsibility, respect, rituals, and relationships makes sense? How do we know that makes urban prep, urban prep is right? It's not the fact that 100% of these guys got into college that convinces me of the fact that we're on the right path. It's Mr. Branch, Mr. Ponder, Mr. Gardner, and the 900 other students that we have across three campuses now. They're the ones that convince me. It's their lives that we're changing. It is, as Martin Luther King would put it, a true education that we're providing. And we together can lead the way up that staircase of faith so that these young men have a chance to live in a world in which it is no longer a big deal for a black boy to get into college. They can live in a world in which every black boy who wants a four-year college degree simply goes and gets one. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. This is a round of applause for Urban Press, Mr. Tim King. <laughs> Mr. King, thank you for your words and uh, presence this afternoon. Um, education, specifically uh, equal access to a quality education. It is the civil rights issue of our time. Uh, and to that end, our young people deserve better. Uh, they deserve a State Department of Ed and administration that will work to hold districts and local administration accountable, as well as create an environment that make high quality educational opportunities accessible. Uh, they deserve local school districts that will do a better job ensuring that the educational product that they provide is of high quality. They deserve teachers, by and large, that do a better job in the classrooms. Uh, and they deserve parents that are more engaged and are adamant about the education uh, or educational success of their sons and daughters. Uh, and just as important, they also owe themselves uh, enough to be accountable for the decisions that they make and unfortunately don't make from time to time. Uh, my name is Jamal Smith and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Civil Rights Commission and we do believe that equal access to a quality education is the civil rights issue of our time and we stand behind that. Um, so again, I say thank you to Mr. King for providing some insight into what continues to make Urban Prep so successful. Uh, thank you to Governor Daniel, uh, Daniels for your support and your timely remarks. Thank you to all of our elected and appointed officials who continue to support uh, and show support to this important event. Uh, thank you to Abdul, who, as he put it, does a fence. I, I call on him quite a bit, and he does a fantastic job of of, of keep, because I know you guys have things to do, and he does a fantastic job of keeping our events uh, on time and on schedule. Um, huge thank you to the MLK Commission for continuing to lead the charge uh, to make sure that the MLK commemoration is ongoing. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I also like to thank the Indiana Civil Rights staff who uh, took the time to make sure that uh, uh, the event was set up today and things were in place. Uh, they also set up the MLK exhibit and photo, photo gallery that is on the other side, the uh, opposing atrium there that we invite everyone to go visit as well. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, in the midst and theme of what we're talking about here with education, I want to thank the young people, all of the young people who took the time and, the, and their teachers and principals and administration who took the time to come out and take part in something outside of the classroom to broaden their educational experiences. We had a group, I think, in upwards of 400 to 500 kids who apparently this was a fantastic program because they never made it over. But they're over at the State Museum uh, uh, partaking in, 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 in 
what I call an, an, an auxiliary event over in the State Museum. And also to the Broad River Choir, who, if this is the first time you've heard them do what they do, they are absolutely fantastic. So thank you guys for coming out and being a part of our program as well. Uh, they're, all, they're actually going to close our event for us this evening.
again, thanks, uh, thank everyone for coming out. God bless you, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.